Uh, my name is Rachel Sklar. I am the VP of Programming and Content at Saxworks. We are a new membership club, co-working space, wellness emporium for all of your needs. We have two locations in New York City, one in the Saks Fifth Avenue flagship store, one in Brookfield Place downtown, as well as a brand new outpost in Greenwich, Connecticut. So that's three locations to get your Saxworks on. We hope you come join us. You can go to saxworks.com and you can sign up for a complimentary day pass and come experience the magic for yourself. Um, this is approximated magic, but the actual real life magic is legit magical. Um, we have Binta Brown today. Binta, we are so happy to have you. Binta is a former Wall Street M&A lawyer and true multi-hyphenate. Uh, I don't even, I can't even like the, the number of things that she's done. I will fail Binta in introducing you, but um, board member of the American Theater Wing. Yes, still, yes, totally voter. Um, uh, worked closely uh, in the uh, Team Obama campaign in 2008 and perhaps other years. Yep. Um, uh, lawyer Cravath, partner Kirkland and Ellis, uh, participator in numerous IPOs, we can get into that, um, has worked with many startups and decided as a, a lifelong musician, is, is, the mus is the instrument count 11 still or did we up it during the pandemic? We did, we upped it, right? I think it's like, I think it's like 13. I think I play 13 instruments. Is timpani one of those? All of us play the timpani. Okay. <laughs> Just a well-placed timpani it's all joke the technique. For, for when you're interviewing someone about music. Um, anyhow, so I don't know. As always in these presentations, this may be my last presentation for Saxworks. One never knows if uh, who's tuning in or <laughs> we shall see. Um, a timpani joke. If that was the straw that was going to break the camel's back, I, I would be okay with that. Um, anyhow. Binta decided she wanted to be a music executive. She wanted to, instead of working to support the industry, she wanted to be in the industry, make the magic happen. And in a blink, she was uh, in the recording studio with Chance the Rapper and uh, working with a variety of amazing artists. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Binta because she's gonna tell us all how she did it, how you can do it, why you should stay off social media and why you need a lawyer. So <laughs> it's which one should I, which question should I answer first? Um, um, I, I think, I think I just, it would be very useful to, to hear about your path because your path is not a traditional one. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I read a lot and, um, and I'm very, very blessed I've had to have, uh, well, I guess both my father's passed away, but to have two extremely supportive parents who um, were kind enough uh, to raise me and my siblings to believe in ourselves uh, and to not see ourselves as being any different from anybody else. Um, and in particular, had a father for whom freedom and the freedom to choose the work that you do in the world uh, and how you benefit others was what he worked for, was so that his kids wouldn't be constrained and wouldn't have to be um, in a position where you know, we, we had to t take the golden handcuffs and, and pursue that life. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I grew up loving music and television and film, um, also a documentary film producer. And, um, and I, I, I've expanded my company, Rachel, you, you wouldn't know this yet because I haven't made any public uh, statements, but maybe eventually I will. But I've expanded my talent ma management company to include authors as well um, uh, to package uh, to package films uh, and television projects and podcasts. Um, Binta, with, are uh, we breaking news? Are we breaking news here at Saxworks Online? I think we I are. guess we I guess we are. Yeah, I, I, I represent a New York Times bestselling author, and we're in the process of uh, doing some really cool things. None of which I'm actually able to publicize yet. Um, but I, it's it's been really cool, and it's a lot of fun because I love film and television. Uh, like really good high quality film and television almost as much as I love music. Um, and uh, I actually think that film and television are great ways to break music, but we can talk about that. Uh, if not today, then maybe at, a, at another time. So I have, I grew up with a lot of support and, and not only very supportive parents, but I have tremendously supportive friends um, among whom I count you uh, and so many other of our mutuals. 
And so, you know, when I got this idea in my head, well, it was, it, there was a couple of things. I had been interviewing probably since my first year uh, at Cravath with different labels and media companies. Um, we were talking about HBO before I interviewed with HBO, which was a client of Cravath, uh, of Cravath's. Um, and, you know, I was getting various offers from these different places, but it wasn't really the work that I wanted to be doing. And my concern was that I would be getting further and further from the creative process as opposed to closer and closer to the creative process and to the strategy and to the business. Um, and so I, I didn't really want to go and be a, a lawyer at a label. And I didn't necessarily want to go and be a, um, a lawyer at, a, you know, a cable cabler. Or, uh, you know, we didn't have the social media then that we have today. And so I just kept meeting and talking to people. And uh, in the meantime, was doing my political stuff on the side and my philanthropic stuff on the side and trying to meet as many people as I could possibly meet. And at one point, you know, I'd been a, I'd been a partner maybe at, at Kirkland, maybe for uh, two or three, maybe four years uh, at this point. And my father, you know, I had started gigging at um, on electric base. I don't remember. I don't know if you remember that era, um, but I was gigging on electric base and different cover bands in the city. I I. Can there are a lot of people who might not remember this because I was actually rather relatively clandestine about this activity. I don't remember being invited, so thanks. But <laughs> can you just like very briefly, like the gigging, like what? So you is you're on, you're playing on the bass for what bands and what 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 outlets, like what clubs? So I would just play in different cover bands, um, and you know, like all throughout, typically, you know, like downtown in Manhattan, and sometimes in Brooklyn. Um, and I found them in a variety of different ways. And I would just tell people like, hey, I play the bass. And honestly, like a lot of dudes, like we have to really use sexism to our advantage. Um, then I was like this, you know, young little thing. And like a lot of guys kind of like the idea of having a female bass. Like, I don't know why they, they're into this, but they're like, oh, cool. You can play. like, they, they didn't even ask if I could play like if I had skills. And then it turned out that I actually have skills. I'm a relatively decent bass bassist. Um, and so I was, I was, you know, undercover, like on, on the DL playing in different bands. And wait, what does that mean I, undercover? Like, because you were still working as a lawyer? Because I was a partner in a major law firm. And I didn't think that my partners would necessarily appreciate, or my clients <laughs> would appreciate uh, <laughs> my, my running around and playing the bass and also, like, my stage persona is not the same as my corporate lawyer persona um, at all. <laughs> like, in my best Adele's child British accent at all, like, it's not, <laughs> you haven't heard the track, apparently. But I have not. I'm sorry. I, I'll send, I'll send like it to week. you later. Okay. But like, I, like, I, like, I, they're totally different. You know, like, it's the difference between wearing, like, a, a beautiful custom suit and then wearing ripped jeans and lots and stacked bracelets and rings and um you know like not even caring if my hair was kempt or not uh sometimes and 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 usually taking a shot of tequila before i would get on stage which i never did while i was practicing i never took a shot of tequila before i negotiated a deal although maybe i should have um in any event, this so, is amazing. I, I did, yeah, did anybody I, ever like find out and, and come and then like stand in the background and be like, hi, hi, where are you from your law firm? Hi. I think the only people I ever really told were my mentees at Barnard College um, because I didn't think that there was any risk of that getting to my clients or my colleagues. Um, and well, but but it's, uh, I, I just want to interject here is that like I actually have something in common with you because as a junior associate at White and Case, I briefly worked as a waitress at Marie's Crisis. So <laughs> I had my awesome. right. I had my musical Jones, and I used to go there and like close it out at four four a.m. And the piano player one day was like, "At least I'm getting paid for this." He's like, "You should work here." I, was like, I should work there. Um, and so I would leave the office at like whenever I was allowed eight nine and I'd go down and I'd have my little, they taught, they told me how to hold a, hold a tray. Cause I was holding the tray like this with the drinks. They're like, no, 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 honey, that's not how you do it. Um, and, uh, I did that until like, I was in my twenties, so I, I could manage it, but I wonder how many, I wonder how many, um, I wonder how many corporate lawyers are, are, are moonlighting. 
in New I York? Think, I think many because corporate law for, for a creative person is, uh, as I know we've discussed, uh, a little bit soul crushing. So let's get back because that's a good segue into why you left. So Sorry I was you know, so I, on this call. So I, so I, so I was, I had a show. My parents would come up from DC to my shows and my father pulled me aside after one show. Actually, he did this after two shows, but so I'm, I'm, I'm combining two different conversations with my father post-show. Um, and, you know, he, he basically said to me, he said, this is what's in your heart. This is what is in your, this is your passion. He's, you know, like anybody, any associate or a colleague who ever came into my office, what they would see what they would see books on the music industry and the film industry, the television industry behind me. Some of them thought that that was what my practice area was, but of course at Kirkland, um, you, there's, there is no such thing as that, as being an entertainment lawyer um, in, in those firms, at least not on the corporate side. Um, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the very, very corporate lawyer, yeah, at corporate level, yes, but that's not the same thing as what I, what I do now and what I've been doing. So my dad pulled me aside and he said, this is your heart and your passion. He's like, I know this is what you want to do. He's like, your mother and I worked as hard as we've worked so that you could um, choose your career as opposed to becoming enslaved by a career. Um, and what are you doing? And why don't you just go and do it? And, you know, like I had been having a conversation with my dad over the years about my frustration because I, I wanted to change things. I wanted to change the status quo in the creative industries. Um, and I, I, I firmly believed and continue to believe in a different approach uh, to how we make market, uh, 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 distribute and release creative projects uh, to the way we interact with creatives themselves um, and to how we structure the business and, and building a really good, strong business with great business fundamentals, which, you know, like that's the part of me that was on Wall Street. Like I believe that businesses should have strong fundamentals and not be smoke and mirrors, which a lot of my colleagues in the music and entertainment industry, uh, they, they don't necessarily focus as much uh, on the fundamentals um, for a variety of different reasons. Vanity metrics uh, tend to be what carry the day in many instances and circumstances. But my dad pulled me aside and he said, you should do this. He said, I believe in you. He said, you'll probably fail miserably, uh, but in doing this, you'll find your freedom and you'll find happiness. And he said, worst case scenario, you can always move back home. Um, and he was right about pretty much everything. I did fail miserably, as you know, Rachel, uh, and, and others know. I, I, I don't know that failure is um, maybe the right word, but I made some mistakes. Uh, I that would were... not characterize anything in your history as failure, but I, but I understand that, that there are obviously rocky elements. All right. Sorry, yeah, I mean, I, I, what I will say is this. I misjudged uh, certain, certain aspects in my start, and I paid the price financially for that. Um, and, and, and have had as a result needed to rebuild uh, my financial status. So, you know, like, I, or my financial, whatever, uh, security, I don't even know what the word is anymore. Um, but, you know, my, but my, my, my father really believed in me. And, you know, when you have a, a, a Southern Catholic, you know, conservative father who says, um, leave your, like, Southern, I mentioned also Black, like, like, there was just all these different things. Like when you have all of the, like coming from that culture, your father says to you, I believe in you, like leave your corporate law job and start your own company in an industry that is the riskiest industry ever. Um, and is full of people who don't necessarily share the same set of values. Um, and where I had no, you know, like I had relationships, but I didn't have the relationships that are ultimately the most helpful relationships. And nor, by the way, does anybody in the music business care about things like where I went to law school or what my academic performance was or the fact that, you know, I was a partner in a big, like they didn't care, you know, like they don't care, like they don't care that, like they don't care about some of the um, notable people whom I've had the great fortune of advising uh, over the course of my, my, my entire career. Like they just care about is, are the artists and the creatives you're working with hot um, and um, when you say hot, like what you mean, I assume you mean hot, like hot talents, buzzy and not hot, like attractive, just clarifying. Well, it can be hot as an attractive too. Um, but, but more specifically, are they buzzing? You know, like, is, is there traction behind them? Like, is there a there there? Um, you know, like, is the market, at, uh, you know, and by that, I mean, like consumers and fans, are they responding to the music that the artist is putting out? Like, are people coming to the shows? Like, are they, are they, um, 
you know, like in the in the conversation, so to speak. I mean, that's what the music business cares about. Can I stop you for two seconds? Because earlier you 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 talked about like not not wanting to be held hostage to things like vanity metrics, but I feel like vanity metrics contribute to the perception of whether or not an artist is hot, particularly to people who might not come at it with sort of a pure artistic sensibility. They may come from the financing side and be eager for a quick hit or something. Um, how, I know I'm like zagging a bit and you're zigging, but um, how do you reconcile those things and or what would be vanity metrics that you would say are reliable indicators? So, I mean, the, the thing is, is that it depends on what you're trying to indicate, right? So um, most vanity metrics, for example, social media posts, like. I tend to ignore things that are easily manipulated or can be manipulated, right? So streaming counts can be manipulated. You can buy streams, um, you can buy playlisting, um, you can buy likes, you can buy um, followers, you know, you can buy, you, you can buy all of these different things, but what you can't manipulate are like, are people actually buying tickets to your shows? Are people actually buying your merchandise? Are people actually, like, are your, are, are your fans coming back over and over again? Do people come and listen to your track like the week it's released and then totally forget about it? Or do they, be, do they begin to develop a, a cohesion with you as the artist or the creative and keep going back over and over and over again and playing more? Um, you know, like, like that, those are the things that matter to me. Um, and then the things that really matter to me are, do you have money in the bank at the end of the year? Um, and, you know, like, you do awesome. You know, like you're generating revenue. That's fantastic. That's great. Um, but what I don't care about are, you know, like, it, you know, like, and and I think that this is beginning to settle down a little bit. You know, there were a couple of articles this week in the music trades uh, that were discussing different other executives more prominent than myself coming out and saying, we can't, you know, like these TikTok signings are kind of dead in the water uh, because we signed them and then there's really not anything else that we can do. Uh, with them like they have one song and like you sign somebody for what 10 million 20 million dollars potentially um you know like and that's like potentially right um and and then and then there's no other there there like you're you're dead in the water um and so i think that people are, are appropriately growing in skepticism there um but yeah i mean i th that's what it means to be hot it really means like are you buzzy um, and then for me, like I try to separate like the, the business fundamentals of are you generating revenue and are you growing something? Because there's some artists actually who are not buzzy at all, uh, who make a lot of money um, and do very, very well because they've focused specifically and narrowly on their fan base and they continue to give their, 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 their fans uh, something of value and their fans continue to support them. Um, there are other artists you who have a, a, like uh, I'm just I'm putting on the spot we haven't discussed this like is there an example of anybody that um, is like that not super buzzy but money uh, to pay. so I mean it's it's hard for me to say because I think all of my artists are for the most part buzzy uh, for my management company um, but I, I I am not you, you know, and like maybe amongst you know like our circles you know like I'm buzzy in part because I left one life to pursue this and so that made me a person of interest but within the music community itself um i i i would not necessarily consider myself to be a buzzy artist manager uh, or music executive um but i can say this um without going into a lot of detail my revenue growth over the last year outpaced the revenue growth for the entire music industry um and i ended 2021 in the middle of a pandemic um, with, with, with like by self-financing my company or, or at least it finances itself through its, through its revenues and earnings. And I ended up with a surplus. Um, so, and, and I don't know many people who can say that. Like, I don't have a credit line. I don't have outside investment of any sort uh, at this point in, the, in, in my current business. Um, and I was still able to generate, you know, a, a, a pretty good uh, 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 level of revenue. But I don't, I don't really advertise that or broadcast that uh, because nobody really needs to know. But I am pleased. Again, that I, uh, we are breaking news here at Saxworks Online. <laughs> 
You heard yeah. it here first. Uh, you know, I, I was really, you know, I really focus on performance, but at the same time as I'm focusing on performance, I do focus on the vanity stuff because the vanity does, it, it, it helps, but it just can't be the end of the story is what I'm trying to say. Got it. Got it. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't want to interrupt you because you were, you were talking about your, your, you know, growth and the things that actually matter. Um, but uh, I did want to sort of hop in on clarifying that. Um, okay, so uh, I totally interrupted you. Um, so you- No, this you, is great. You, so your dad Slow. takes you aside, Slow. right? Your strong friends. <laughs> yeah, your, your dad takes you aside uh, and, and just like my parents did, said, go pursue your artistic. No, I'm just kidding. My parents were very enthusiastic about me going to law school, but you know, uh, I, the classic sort of thing is your, the parents will say like, what are you doing? Go get a job. Um, but then also a parent who really knows you and sees you will say, go pursue your dream. Which my parents yeah, my dad said, my what are you doing? You've got a job and a great career. Go blow it up. <laughs> I mean, I think there is a certain time in your, in one's life, right? Where you, where you do, especially, I think a lot of people, certainly in the pandemic, there was a point of like, okay, what what do I want to do when I emerge from this? Uh, you know, if I once I write the financial ship, which many of us had to do, what what do I want to do? I these these I lost two years. I lost whatever the path I was on. What's next? And and you know, new technologies emerging and new opportunities and new paradigms. So there's there's and you're certainly a testament to that because you the you've experienced such professional growth during the pandemic um so let's um so yeah so let's get back to that so basically you say okay dad okay mom i'm gonna gonna move back home and and realize our dreams i don't know if you actually moved back home i didn't i didn't move back i i did eventually end up having to move home <laughs> because it got, you know like because i also had you know and, and and i'm i'm fine disclosing this you know but the other, but and I, and I disclose this because I think it's really important for people to know that nothing should operate as an impediment um, when there's something that you want to pursue uh, and build. And what I mean by that is, you know, as as you might recall, Rachel, not only was I a partner in a big law firm, but I also had massive medical bills um, from 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 several. Uh, uh, very, very difficult medical situations, multi-organ failure, it took a long time to recover and, you know, complications with sickle cell disease and things of that nature. And so, I, you know, like I, I, I was already burning through my savings uh, so that I could stay alive, which is what in some ways made it even crazier um, that I would leave the corporate lifestyle, which is very secure and great to be when you have a complicated medical history um, and need to have that platinum insurance, that Cadillac insurance plan. Um, because all the insurance underneath that sucks, by the way. And I know this now because, and I didn't know it before, but I know it now, um, you know, that, that anything short of what, you know, like the, the, like the kind of insurance that I got as a partner in a big law firm was remarkable. And I wish that everybody in the country had that level and degree of insurance and protection. But even with that, I had massive medical expenses. And so I did end up eventually having to, to, to move back home. Um, now I'm, now I'm there by choice, although I, I have a, a place in Chicago and, um, am frequently in hotels in, uh, New York and, uh, uh New York and, and, and Los Angeles. But, um, I, you know, I did, you know, like I, I it, it was helpful for me to go back home. So what, what I did was, you know, I, the first thing I did, I left my practice. I went to Harvard, uh, for two years. I did a fellowship there where I, um, spent more time studying the music business and, um, understanding different models and thinking about what I could possibly do and building more relationships. Um, I didn't realize that going to Harvard was a strange way uh, to start in the music business. But like I said before, I read a lot and Clive Davis has a degree from Harvard, so why shouldn't I? Um, and I didn't get a degree, I just did a fellowship, uh, just to be clear. Um, and- That's um, the fellowship. Honestly, I can't look, come back when you have that degree. Okay, continue. Sorry, <laughs> I, I'm, I I'd like to get one, but I don't know if I have time right now. But um, but but so yeah, so I, I I did that, and you know, like even before I left my law practice, you know, I would stand out. I would go to clubs and watch different bands, and I you know I was one of those people who would uh, I would go to like all of the different music festivals by myself, and I would just try to meet whomever I could meet, um, young bands and and things of that nature, and 
I, you know, I would, I would stand, you know, on street corners uh, and go to different events, uh, you know, like in my expensive corporate lawyer uh, uniform. And I would hand out flyers and mixtapes and things of that nature. So you know how sometimes we see the people in the street, rarely now, but back, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you would see people in the street handing out CDs, trying to promote different artists. I, I did that because I, I felt like I needed to have that experience. So I, I literally have, have had, I think at this point, pretty much every role uh, you can have uh, in the music business. And just started meeting artists and um, one thing led to the next and there was an artist uh, with whom I started working and started building something up around that artist. And as a result of the work that I was doing with that artist, I ended up uh, meeting Chance, which was actually something I had wanted to happen because um, a huge fan of his and really believed in his business model and the way he was approaching things. And, you know, like as soon as I became available and became free, which is maybe a couple years in, um, Chance's team asked, started, had began asking if I would come and join them and work with them. Um, and then uh, I guess like officially at the end of 2018, uh, uh, I started working with Chance's team. Um, and then I, you know, I did that for a couple of years. And, you know, the music business is pretty volatile uh, and, and there's very little that lasts forever in the music business. Um, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but the hard, hard, harsh reality is that artists and creatives do come and go. Um, and, you know, there, there are, there is that group of people who are career artists and who can, who have big, long careers, but for the most part, artists come and go. And some of the most recent data actually on Spotify that was um, released and summarized yesterday in the trades um, supports this, right? I mean, there, it's something like only 8%. I might get, I'm probably going to get these numbers wrong because I'm still studying them, but um, maybe only 8% of the artists who release through Spotify are generating enough income uh, to like call it like a life uh, and, you know, to, 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 for it to be a business, so to speak. Um, and a lot of the artists who are in there, like I think like some, something like 5.8 million of the artists who release have, le have released less than 10 songs, right? So we don't really consider that to be a career necessarily, or they have less than 10,000 monthly followers. Um, so the vast majority, you know, so artists and people who call themselves creative, they come and they go, they're in and they're out. Um, and then there's the rest of us who are building businesses around that. And, you know, like we tend to, we tend, some of us come and go too. So it's a pretty volatile um, industry for a variety of different reasons. And, you know, like things in the chance operation, you know, I'm very pleased to say, by the way, he has a new single out today, which everybody should check out. Things in the chance operation. Wait, 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 what's, the, what's it called? It's called Child of God, and my artist, um, Peter Cottontail, is the producer of that track. They worked on that track together when they were in Ghana um, uh, in December and January of this year. Um, so I, 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 like, I, I ended up needing to leave Chance's team because I was brought in by his manager, and I did not want to continue working with his manager. Chance did not want to continue working with his manager either. I did not want to end up embroiled in another legal mess uh, because I was already in a legal, uh, already in the midst of litigation uh, with someone who breached contract. And so I didn't, and so I thought the thing that made the most sense for me was for me to just stop working with Chance um, altogether because otherwise I risked a lawsuit coming from his former manager uh, who uh, is extremely wealthy. Uh, and I wouldn't have been able to defend that. And I just didn't, I didn't want the trouble. And so I, you know, I cut things clean. I joined a label called Keep Cool, which was in a joint venture with RCA, um, headed by Twinji Belogan. Uh, and in the meantime, continued refocusing on rebuilding and restructuring my own talent, uh, uh, talent and rights management uh, company uh, and getting into film uh, and putting out th this little film called Fly Like a Girl, which I highly recommend to everybody, which is about the, the history of women and girls in aerospace and aeronautics. It's a great film. Um, and, and building a, a production company, a film production company with my partners in Florida. So I, yeah, I mean, it's just one thing kind of led to the next. And what I've tried to do um, is to be prepared uh, and to, to meet as many people. I, you know, I, I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned about how to 
you know, set aside the Wall Street persona because it doesn't really work in the music business in the same way. Um, and um, I, I, I've, you know, like, you know, I've learned a lot about the differences in supporting and advising clients in the creative space for and, and artists versus the differences when you're representing a company or individuals who work for a company or who, or who own a company. Um, and I've just been applying all of that different learning and knowledge to, to build something that's new and that's my own and to figure out, you know, what I, what I want to do and what I want to be in the world. And I, I'm having a great time doing what I get to do. I'm excited for the future. I mean, Brenda, this is, this is, uh, incredible. Your, your stories are incredible, but also just the hope from it, right. That you can make choices and rebound from things that, um, that if it's not having a happy ending, then that's not the end. All of those, all of those sort of harsh life lessons that if you've lived a bit of life <laughs> and then you, you've lived a bit of that. Um, uh, and, I mean, these, this is a conversation that's very relevant to me because as you know, I am also a music person on the side. It's on the side until it pays your bills. Um, again, Saxworks, I am so happy to be here. You are my <laughs> priority, but I also, I'm also a songwriter. I live with a composer who also does web design on the side. Like we all, we're doing everything. Um, and uh, I'm in the BMI musical theater workshop with, with you know the cream of the crop of talent uh, in emerging musical theater. and I daily see how hard it is for people who are that I've I've seen their work product and you know I've gone to their workshops and the workshop is great and then where does it go right everything requires funding it requires being able to <laughs> leave your house and go to the theater um, and uh, and it requires being able to withstand the grind uh, so this and, is it what it, and it requires. Required. It, it requires, you know, like for me, because, you know, I've, I, I, I've, I've had my, I mean, as you know, I've had my peaks and I've had my valleys, you know, my, my, my ups and my downs, and it requires depersonalizing as much of it as you possibly can. Um, because when you take it personally, and or if you make the mistake of allowing others to define you, and people are going to define you in whatever way they want to, because it's to their benefit, their benefit, not yours, to define you in ways that enable them to compete the way they want to compete against you. And so what I try to do is be ignorant of all of that and uh, to thine own self be true and to know that on my best days and my worst days, I'm still loved, I'm still loved by my family and my friends uh, and, and myself, <laughs> um, and uh, which is important. You know, love thy neighbor as you love yourself or you love one another as you love yourself. That's what it says in the Bible, right? Um, like all over the Bible, actually. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I know, like, I, I think that what the challenge was for me, like transitioning into a, a new career and a new profession, oh, there are a bunch of challenges. But one of them was that honestly, like, um, you know, there are a lot of things that came relatively easy to me, you know, for the first part of my career. Um, and there are a lot of different reasons for that, you know, like, I, like it, it for me, it was relatively easy to just sit. like I like studying, I like reading, I like being a student. So it was relatively easy for me to excel in college. It was relatively easy for me to excel in law school because I like, you know, like I like it's it's there's there's nothing that's subjective about it when you're, you know, like you you either do the work and you're prepared and you can sit down and you can take an exam or you don't, <laughs> you know, so that's. <laughs> when talking about law, I think there's a third, there's a third piece in law school. It depends on how you're tested. I mean, this is like, I'm getting into the weeds, but one of the reasons that I was able to do well in law school is because we had hundred percent finals that were open book and it was three hours. And if you were a person who could write quickly and well, you had a distinct advantage. Um, right. Uh, so that was an versus I, I, the yeah. things like doing, like if you're a hundred percent grade is for a paper that you could grind on all semester. I, my my advantages were in, <laughs> were clearly different in different places, but I I remember being very aware of sort of I didn't know to call it privilege at that point, and I certainly didn't know to call everything I was experiencing that point privilege. Obviously, we all learn, but I was aware that I I had an advantage in that how we were being graded was not was not always like fair to everybody in terms of what they're bringing to the table. 
that, that that's 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 fair and that's what i meant by like i i like the first part of my career yeah, i'm sorry very, i just went off on like a little law, law but, 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 but it's an important it's an important thing and i appreciate the clarification it, like it, it came easy to me it you know like it was easy for me to like i i i know that i had classmates who hated sitting I, in fact one of my best friends still reminds me to this day that she refused to sit next to me during exams because i would sit down i would read the question i would write an outline at the top of my blue book. And then an hour later I'd leave and I would end up with an A. And that's annoying to people. Um, but it was just like, it came easy to me, you know? And so because of that, you know, like going into law, like it actually came, you know, like there, there were aspects of going into law that didn't come easy to me, like being a black woman, you know, in a, you know, in a, in a white shoe setting uh, where they apparently weren't used to that many of us being around or, you know, like presumed that we didn't want to have the same career as they wanted to have, or, you know, in some cases would presume that we didn't come from the same background they had. And so wouldn't necessarily have that same level of refinement when interacting with clients. So like, there are little things like that, but I, like, those were hurdles that were relatively easy for me because I, I chose to see that as their disadvantage and my advantage when I was negotiating, because I, 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 I use, you know, like I've always used my gender and my race, not as crutches, um, and, and not as a source of bitterness or anger or frustration, but I've always, always used it knowing that other people like are, are going to second guess or, 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 or be prejudiced or be bigoted or sexist or what have you. And I use it to my advantage to be better prepared. Um, and like, I love that, you know, like, like with, with, with the uh, confirmation of uh, uh, Judge Brown Jackson, I, I love that we you know, generationally uh, and racially and otherwise had to be 200% prepared because like, how great is it when you, when everybody sets up like the data for her and compares her and what she did on her path to becoming a Supreme, like you can't, you, you can't yeah. interpret it any other way other than like, look, this woman is qualified. No, right? it is, so, it is embarrassing to put those check marks uh, up next to Amy Coney Barrett. And it's, it, it is, I would say, you know, I was reflecting yesterday that there, that it is, I mean, it's jaw dropping the hypocrisy coming from uh, people who are, who are, who are in opposition, um, uh, non-denominational, uh, uh, non unbiased sex works moderator here. Um, but, uh, but it is, it is, it's almost a gift to have the hypocrisy laid so clearly bare. It's like, come on, Mitch McConnell, you are not fooling anybody here. Anyone, anyone. So, you know, like I, I, I use that to my advantage, right? Because there's certain, you can't, you know, you can argue with opinions, but you cannot argue with facts. And if you argue with facts, you're an idiot. It's a waste of time, right? So like- I do love you, Binta. Like, and, and, and the, the facts are what the facts are. So like I use, I've always used this to my advantage and said, you know, like they're gonna be certain environments in which I know that I'm going to be counted out. But here's the thing, going back to what I was saying before, my parents raised us to not see ourselves as being any different and certainly not less than any other person based on gender, class, race, religious, like any of it. Like they raised us to believe in ourselves and to think that we could do whatever we put our minds to. And so for me, the whole, the whole trajectory of my life has been, have I adequately or in some cases more than adequately, have I put my mind to it? Have I put my heart to it? And if I do that, then I should be fine. Um, and, you know, it's just the music business, there, there, there are a couple, and, and entertainment in general, like there are a couple of other factors, you know, like because people come to music and success in, in music in so many different ways. I compete against a lot of people, you know, like I can, I, I, I did, one of the mistakes I made was I did think that my pedigree mattered. It doesn't <laughs> at all. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, I, I thought that who I knew mattered. It doesn't really matter. It matters what I can do for the people whom I know, but whom I know doesn't really matter. Like, what matters is, is the stuff I'm working on cool and do fans like it? Yes, they do, great. That's what matters, you know? So it, it like, it, it, it's very different from, you know, some of the other things where, you know, like as a young lawyer in New York, like it, you know, like, it, people acted like it mattered which law firm you went to or where you went to law school or how you performed in law school. Like those things, they don't matter in the music business because half the people I'm competing against don't have, have only a high school education. 
if they have a full high school education. Some of them, like the capital that they use to start their businesses, ill-gotten gains. That's all I'll say. Like it wasn't necessarily like work on Wall Street, save some money, help some companies go public, move in with your parents for a little while. Like, no, like they were out there in the streets and they were hustling and they figured it out and their stuff became really hot and people started to do deals with them, right? So there's so many different ways that people come to it. And so, I mean, that's taught me something really important about how to engage and to interact with others, which is that it just matters what I'm bringing to the table um, and that I, I prepare for the environment that I'm in and that I don't ride on what I've done in the past, which, you know, for anybody who's been in their career for 10 or 15 years, there is a potential and a possibility of writing on what you've done in the past instead of really focusing on what you're doing in the now and what you're going to do in the future. I mean, I will say it. I have had a similarly sort of checkered path, and I have. It's it's almost as though I have pointedly switched it up so that I could not ride on anything I'd done, like going from being a lawyer to being a writer like going from being a writer to being an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur going, uh, and you're and as you know as a fellow entrepreneur uh and uh then you know deciding that uh to, to apply and then reapply and reapply to the bmi musical theater workshop in my 40s as a single mom and then getting in and being like okay here i am like <laughs> i guess the only way i can prove myself here is by grinding it out and writing some good stuff um so so i i mean i i really get and it by I the way you're good. you're on pace because our lives are going to be long lives um, i mean first, where's the wood first, first, first and foremost secondly there are a lot of people i'll like this is one of the things that i and i haven't really figured out the right way for us to go about this but you know like this obsession with youth culture is a relatively recent thing there are a lot of people across entertainment who don't start breaking until their 40s. <laughs> like, and maybe not the pop stars. Pop stars break when they're 18, 19 years old. Um, although Sia broke when she was 39, maybe even 40. Um, so Sia broke really late compared to the average uh, pop star. Um, but, you know, like, but, you know, like, people who are writing plays and musicals like a lot of the time like that like it takes time because you have to build you have to do it for so long before you start having really really good stuff um you know like I have writers whom I'm, I'm talking to and thinking about signing you know who are in their uh late 40s and early 50s uh and their names are just beginning to bubble up because it takes it does these things do take time like the notion that we we're all born and then you know by the time you're 15 years old you you've you've written like the world's greatest opera, the world's greatest, you know, musical, like that, that doesn't happen as often as people would like uh, to think it happens. It takes time. I, mean, I, I the, the flip side of that is that like, I'm very well aware of just talent and immersion where, you know, the, the sort of like the most, the, the TikTok generation, Gen Z, whatever, like they, they, their time formatively was spent really immersing in this new technology and, and developing their talents um, and, and I feel pretty happy to be learning from those people and, and, and hopefully, but also be able to, you know, like bring something to the table. I, it's, it is, it has mostly been exciting for, for me. I'm, I'm, I have like certain built-in limitations now in terms of what I can pursue. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, very, there's lots of things that are exciting to contemplate. And I think there's always something exciting to contemplate if you are a curious person who has passions and responds to where the world is going and you know I, and the, and limitations and constraints are strengths when we choose to see them that way that I mean that's something that I've I, I and I, I forget this every now and then <laughs> but but there but there's you know so let's take the pandemic right like I I like <laughs> like in 2020 all of our concert like concert revenue is like a substantial portion of the money that we make uh, in music. And, you know, like we all, like all of my artists, myself, we faced potential financial ruin as a result of the pandemic and the shutdown of live. Um, but I, you know, I, I worked with my artists and what we all decided to do was to see it as an opportunity um, and the constraints and the limitations that were imposed on us. And I think that that's why we, 
we all came out of it relatively well. Um, and, you know, it's not to say that it's perfect, you know, because everything is ups and downs. Um, but a lot, it, it was choosing to see it not as the end of the world, but the beginning of opportunity and a different opportunity. So the different constraints that you have, um, as serious as they may be, you know, sometimes it's, it could be your source of greatest inspiration. It could be the inspiration that you were looking for. Um, sometimes it could be something that causes and forces you to discipline yourself in different ways um, because you realize, you know, what's writing on it. You know, like I, I oftentimes think about something that Barbara Walters once said uh, around the publication of her memoir. And, and you know, I went to a couple of her um, readings and, and, and book parties. And she would say during these Q and A's, she would say, you know, people would say, well, you know, why did you do it? You know, like, I mean, she, she had a, she's had a legendary career uh, as a woman in broadcast journalism. And she said, I had no choice. I had to survive. Like I knew that if I was going to have money and be able to eat, like I needed to be good and great at what I was doing. Right. So, you know, I, I think that today a, a lot of young people or younger people, or maybe not even people who are that young, but sometimes we'll look at ourselves and we'll say, and I've done this even, I've done this as recently as yesterday. <laughs> I've said, ah, oh, you know, like if I had, you know, $5 million worth of investment, here are the different things that I can do. But what I woke up this morning and said is, I don't have $5 million worth of investment. So this is what I need to do in order to continue building and scaling and growing my company the way I want to build and scale and grow it. Um, and, 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 you know, because it is a, a matter of survival. I have people who are relying and who are depending on me and, and others who aren't necessarily, but people whom I want to support uh, and my family and my extended family. And so I know that my ability to do that is a function of my, of, of my success. So I, I work very hard uh, to build something that's of value. Binta, um, this is a segue into another thing that I wanted to make sure we talked about, and I led with this when I when I when I shared that we were talking about this, is when you build something that you want and you protect it, and you you need a lawyer. I want to please tell oh, them yeah. why we, that. especially women, why we need lawyers, why we need them now, why we need them for the big things, but we also need them for the small things. Uh, I would please I. Because this is this falls under the category of like do as I say, not as I've done. So lawyers. The, the, the biggest mistake I've made in my life was not hiring counsel. Um, you need a lawyer because, and you need somebody whom you trust to advise you, um, because we're not the best advocates for ourselves, and we you you can't when you're in something, you you you're not necessarily going to see your way around every single corner. You're not gonna see all of the blind spots. It's good to have somebody who's a little bit removed from the situation who can both guide you and who can point out the trouble spots and who can ask you questions. Um, it's also really, really good to make sure that you have somebody who will protect you um, because unfortunately people are dishonest um, and people, are, people lie. And they backtrack, and they're greedy, uh, and they're or they can be greedy, uh, and there are a whole bunch of other uh, values which are really not values to me at all, but but vices um, that that we rely upon. People are, have can be ruled by their insecurities. People uh, become become bitter. We betray one another, and so it's really good to have something that sets the rules of the road for what the relationship's going to be. And even if things are going really really great. Um, it's really good to have it anyway, because then you have the awareness that there's a piece of paper that exists between you so that if you forget, or God forbid, you should pass away or become incapacitated, people understand what your understanding was and, and what you hoped, uh, like how you hoped the, the relationship would play out um, and what, what your intentions were. I mean, you can't, you don't necessarily, you're not, we're not always able to legislate all of our intentions, but we, to have somebody alongside you who can help make sure that you're protected and that you're doing things in the right way. Um, and that it's in writing. And that it's in writing because, you, and, and, and I, I think, you know, for me as a person who, I, like I'm a very passionate person and I also believe the best in everyone. 
Um, and it's not that I'm gullible or naive. My mother says that I can't be <laughs> both of those things. Um, and she's probably not wrong, but it, it's not just a matter of being gullible or, or, or you know, like I genuinely believe it, it's because I expect others to act as I would act in a setting, to treat others fairly and with love and with generosity and with kindness. And I expect people to do what they say they're going to do. So if somebody says to me they're going to do it, I expect them to do it. But, you know, when it comes down to money and when it comes down to a lot of money and when it comes down, when it comes down sometimes to people who are whispering in your ear and saying, well, you should do this or you should do that or you could get more money if you did this or you don't have a contract, right? So that person's screwed, you know, or like, like it, it enables people to do the wrong thing, right? And so I think that it's, it's helpful to have something that's in writing. Um, and it's, it's an act of love and it's an act of self-love to commit to having things in writing between yourself and another party. And, and it's an act of self-love. It's an act of self-love. Get that lawyer. Hold on, because, I wanna, for two seconds, I just wanna invite people oh. to submit to the Q&A if they have any cues for Binta to A, but, um, but I wanna keep on this. And Binta, I also wanted to, to ask why women are less likely to think they should have a lawyer, but in fact, more likely to need one. You know, we're, we're I think that we are, and I, and I think that it's different depending on, I'm not gonna say that it's different depending on whether you're a white woman or a black woman, although I think that that's what some people would say. Um, I think it's different depending on how you're socialized as a woman. Um, and because there's some black women who are, are socialized in ways that are similar to the way many white women are socialized, even if those black women don't have the same societal advantages as a white woman might have. Right. And so to me, it's really important to, 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 to suss through that because I, I'm one of those in between people. Right. Like I, I, I'm like a third culture kid in the way that I grew up and, and was raised and what I was exposed to. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think that I, I think that we I think there's a couple of things. I think sometimes as women, we think that we have to do everything ourselves because we don't always trust everybody. Um, I think that we are, you know, I, I don't I actually don't know why women are less likely to ask for help. Maybe it's because we haven't always gotten it. Maybe it's because we haven't been taken seriously when we've asked for, when we've asked for it. Uh, maybe it's because uh, we have received various gendered responses, um, some of which are misogynistic, harassing, uh, and otherwise. Um, maybe because we're not sitting around, you know, at the, in the same places where the guys are talking about how they do in structured deals uh, and how they protect themselves. Um, maybe it's because people literally will tell us that we do not need to protect ourselves, that everything is going to be just fine. Maybe it's a function, um, and this is particularly true, I think, for Southern white women and the Southern flower. Maybe it's a function of your man is going to protect you. Um, you, you, are, you get married so that you can have the benefit of your husband's wealth and stature and status. Um, and you're not expected to do, to do anything because you're a delicate little flower. Uh, and, and, and so you don't have to have your own counsel uh, in, this, in this case. Maybe it's a vestige of that. And you know, like some people might say, well, is that what you just said is a kind of obnoxious thing. I'm like, no, 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 no. You gotta read the history. Like there is a concept of, this, of Southern womanhood and the Southern flower. And it runs through a lot of different things in society. So, I, you know, like I think maybe it's potentially a function of that. Maybe it's that we weren't, uh, you know, like maybe we weren't allowed to go to the same schools as men uh, for a long time, or even encouraged to go and get degrees, let alone work. Um, and so it's a function of just getting into to the workforce and getting into the entrepreneurial spaces. I don't know on everything that I'm saying, and I wanna be very clear about this, this is speculation. I haven't done any research. I don't have data on it. Um, it's just my, my guess. I don't know what the reasons are, but I do know that for whatever reason, we as women have tended to not protect ourselves in the same way as men do, and we should stop doing that. <laughs> and it's more important, quite frankly, for all of the reasons I just stated. 
right? Because anybody who's telling you that they're going to protect you and that they're going to take care of you, if, that, if you're relying on their word to do so and it comes down to dollars and cents and they think they're gonna lose, they are not going to put your interest above their own. People do not actually tend, only Jesus Christ in my recollection and knowledge, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, and a handful of others have put everybody else's life ahead of their own life. Most of us do not put our survival ahead. I'm sorry, most of us do not put our survival behind other people's survival, right? And so if it comes down to the dollars and cents and how you're gonna make it and break it in the world, and there's not something there to protect you, like all of those promises that a person has made, a lot of people are not gonna carry through. I mean, there are some who will, you know, like I, I hope that whatever I have orally promised to somebody else, I will follow through. But there's things that happen, like your memory gets changed. I mean, look at how many inputs and, you know, like I have like three screens in front of me right now, like, and, and, and then my device. And while all of my notifications are turned off, there are times during the day where my notifications aren't turned off. I have multiple clients, multiple responsibilities, multiple things that are going on. We do forget what we say some, from time to time. So it's good to have that in writing. Yeah, I, I hope that I've answered your question. No, I think you've you've more than answered it. I'm I'm I'm. We don't have a Q and A, so I wanted to just um, push it a little bit more. I think that there, um, you know, uh, it's there there. There's a greater pen, greater penalty for women for advocating for themselves. Uh, right. There's lots of data that shows that that women can get sort of angry and forceful if they're advocating for others, but if they're advocating for themselves, that is, you know, that in a man that's seen as as forceful and positive. And I've done that. I've, you know, like I, I am, it's funny. Like I didn't realize I was doing this until I was out on my own. I am used to advocating for and taking care of other people. Um, and, and in fact, my business is doing that as well. Um, I did not realize the extent to which I had internalized my fear of people perceiving me as being all of the negative stereotypes of a black woman, loud, angry, like immature, um, like all of these different things. I internalized, I had no sense as to how much, and this is part of the reason why I don't do social media as much any longer. I had internalized everything, that, even people who are advocating on behalf of black women, will advocate on behalf of black women by saying, here are all the negative stereotypes. So it, it just, it keeps reinforcing it over and over and over and over again, right? So I was very blessed to grow up with, and my company is named for my two grandmothers, Oma Dell and Lillian, Oma Lily, like two amazing grandmothers, an amazing great grandmother whom I knew. My mother is extraordinary, my aunts are extraordinary. And I grew up during the eighties. And so the black women whom I saw on TV, you know, like, and anybody who's younger than 45, like bear with us, but like the Cosby show was a really big and important deal, you know, like, like seeing Felicia Allen Rashad in that role as a black woman lawyer on television and primetime television was really, really powerful for me. So I grew up with really strong images. And then there became this period where I was inundated with all of the negative Im images, like things that my parents had actually protected me from. And, and, and I had no sense of them until I was in my 20s uh, and maybe mid 20s. And so when it came to advocating for myself, because I was so concerned about that stereotype, I backed off. And I literally said to someone, and this has cost me a half billion dollars. And this is why I am so adamant that people get legal counsel. I said, it's okay. It will all be, because I didn't want to be the loud, angry, aggressive. I didn't want to be accused of being a narcissist. I didn't want to be accused of, of all of these negative stereotypes of Black womanhood, which in the litigation with this person, I was accused of anyway. <laughs> so like, it's not, it's not like, it's not like you can win. So it's really important, you know, like, and, and, and Judge Brown Jackson and her hearings and her, her testimony and everything this week that she said, and it's so important when she said, it's really important to shut out all of that noise and to do what's really important to protect yourself. And if you think that you might not protect yourself because you're aware of stereotype, 
And, you know, like even the Southern flower thing I said before, that's enforcing a negative stereotype of Southern white women and Southern white womanhood. Like, it, like if, if you think that you might not have the ability, you, the thing to do is to go in to get somebody who's gonna speak for you and argue for you and advocate for you in the way that you advocate for others, right? The other thing that we have to do, all of us as women, regardless of our race, income, background, any of it, the other thing that we have to do is we need to think about it from a meditative perspective, which is, you know, take it, observe it, throw it away. Don't ingest it. Don't allow it to define you. Don't let it allow it to affect you. Right. And, and, and I did that, you know, and I, and I, and, and, and I understand in my case, there are other things like when you have multiple stresses, you have multiple factors, multiple things that are going on in your life. So for me, I was in, I was losing my father. I, you know, I was financially insecure for the first time, not in my career, but in my life. Um, you know, I, I was trying to make it in a new industry that I was trying to understand, trying to figure out how to, you know, like fit, not fit in so much as how to be successful within, within that, within that culture, which was a very different culture from Wall Street, very different culture from the Ivy League schools I attended. Um, you know, I was trying to figure out how to assert myself in the right way. There's a lot of stress, compounded stress that is upon us. And I think that the more that you have going on, the, the more wary you are. Uh, and, and there was something else that was happening socially, which is uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and the kinds of things that people will say in the media about all of us, right? And the more you are exposed to that, it can kind of get in your head a little bit and you can start thinking about it. And so, you know, I, I, I had very, you know, I, I have certainly internalized different forms of white supremacy. I have certainly internalized and, and, and had to deal with the fact that I internalized these things, internalized negative stereotypes of, of black womanhood that I shouldn't have and that colored the way I was moving in the world. And, in, and I think that the thing for me that made it that made it detrimental. And the reason why it ended up costing me so much money was because I was losing my father at the same time, uh, who had been my rock in that regard uh, and had been that confidence. And, and he wasn't well enough <laughs> to be the person who whispered in my ear and saying, you need to go and get <laughs> X, Y, and Z. Um, and he would have actually, had he been, had he been healthy. So, oh God, you know, yeah. I, I think that a lot of us, if we don't have that you know, like if there's any deterioration in our support for whatever reason, we're just less likely to pursue what we need to pursue. So we just need to keep reminding one another as much as we possibly can. And now I've spoken way too much and way too long, but hopefully it's helpful and interesting to whomever is still in, whomever is still listening. That no, I am I am pretty sure that you just um, saved uh, at least one person, probably more, uh, significant funds at some point in the future because it's it's. It's true. You need you need to protect yourself. You need to listen to yourself. This is the takeaway from everything you've said: is like protect yourself, listen to yourself, trust yourself, and uh, and, and, and protect cry. yourself. You know, like I, you know, like I know that a lot of us use social media as a tool, um, but we have to be aware. You know, and everybody likes to talk about social media having a negative effect on teenagers' minds and brains, and. My argument is that it's not just having a negative effect on teenagers. I think that it has a negative effect on everybody. And I'll, you know, I'll close this off by saying part of the reason why I, it would, I wanted to be in music, uh, film and television and media was because what we do has an extraordinary effect and impact on shaping the way we think about ourselves and one another and how we relate with one another. And if we want to have progress as a society, the kind of creative we're exposed to really does matter, right? So why was Donald Trump elected? In part, because of the kind of crap that had been put up on television for as long as it's been put up on television, because of what was happening in the news media. So it matters who's running these companies. It matters that women be there. It matter that, matters that people of color be there. I think it matters that black women be, be there and that we be visible. Like it matters, it matters who is running these businesses because these businesses more than our politics, more than our laws, more than anything else 
these business, and this is, you know, like, why did Putin shut off everything? Because the images we're exposed to shape how we think about ourselves, one another, and the world that we're in. And, and, and so it is critically important that we think about what we're exposing, to our, exposing ourselves to, the toxicity of all of it, when we go on and we're doom scrolling. You know, we, we notice that our anxiety is increasing. We notice that we're getting more depressed, that we're growing in hopelessness and all of these other different things. Why? Because we are exposing ourselves to stuff that doesn't, isn't fulfilling to us as humans. You know, like it, it's, it's not gonna make us feel better. So I think it's, that's why I stopped using social media as often because it doesn't make me feel good. Um, Binta, this this was an, a jam packed ex, like finish. We are so over time, so I I feel bad about <laughs> who I'm keeping from whatever else they have to do. Um, Go get lunch, everybody. But uh, but I I wanted to thank you for this. Um, I will if I find a joyful TikTok, I will send it to you though. I promise I will curate it. Like this, Please, the important send, me, send me joyful things. I like, I will send you joyful things. I like laughing at the stuff that people send to me, and you know I'm not a hypocrite like I, I you know my artist like I have to market I, their tools I have to market artists Listen, and, I have retweeted for you like, more on more than one occasion so so we do we do know that these these are all tools that we bring in um we're gonna have to bring you back because uh I'd you're be happy to you have a lot of amazing um a lot of amazing wisdom to contribute thank you everybody who stuck with us <laughs> uh and joined us today um Binta Brown, you are a marvel. Uh, I'm so happy to have had the chance to talk to you uh, and can't wait to welcome you back, clearly. Thank you, everybody. Let's do this again. We will. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks from Saxworks. <laughs>